This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area. Informed Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. Quiet on the set. Soon we will all be more informed. We appreciate learning more of our region's news and public affairs. Cameras rolling. Hello, I'm Marcia Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. The Saints fans have been there before. The final day of the season, the team still has a chance to make the playoffs, but they will need help from another game, and the help never comes. Last Sunday, the season ended with a big win and a major disappointment, but at least the win was over the Atlanta Falcons, and the basketball Pelicans are playing better. In Baton Rouge, Jeff Landry was celebrating a really big win as he was inaugurated governor. For him and the other newly sworn officials, the next season has already begun. And a more celebrated Atlanta presence is Dr. Martin Luther King, whose annual federal holiday is Monday. We'll look at his history, impact, and recognition in New Orleans. Carnival is making its seasonal impact locally. A new study analyzed the city's cost versus the benefits. The verdict is no surprise, but the numbers may be. Joining us are our informed sources. Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources. Will Sutton, columnist, the Times Picayune, the New Orleans Advocate. Greg LaRose, editor, Louisiana Illuminator. And Jeff Duncan, sports columnist, the Times Picayune, the New Orleans Adv Advocate, and also analyst for Fox 8 Sports. Greg, we're over to you first because mm -hmm. we had an inauguration this week of a new governor and uh, some plans for immediate future action. Yeah, he got busy right away uh, with, uh, with a call for a special session that's devoted to redistricting Louisiana's congressional districts because there's a deadline imposed by a court to get that done by the end of January. Uh, he's also calling on lawmakers to re, uh, redraw the districts for the U.S. Supreme Court, and there's really uh, some clash between clashing between the justices themselves over what those are going to look like. Uh, also issued an executive order that uh, got rid of uh, an appeals process for high school seniors who otherwise pass uh, in qualify to graduate, but they fail the LEAP test. Uh, Governor Edwards, basically on the way out the door, cleared the way for that to be implemented, uh, and with one of his first executive orders, Governor Landry, uh, just pulled that back. So no appeals now for seniors who don't pass the LEAP? No, uh, and this goes back to last summer when the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, Bessie, uh, in a very narrow margin, decided to put in that appeals process. The feeling was that in many other states where they have an exit exam, there's still a way to appeal uh, if you don't pass the test. Uh, the opposition to that idea, which also, you know, turned up uh, when Bessie passes uh, policy, it goes to a legislative education committee. And that House committee uh, rejected that policy in November, I believe, and in December, uh, outgoing Governor Edwards essentially overrode the vote mm -hmm. of the House committee uh, and put it in place. Uh, but it won't happen because Landry pulled it back, which okay. means that, you know, there's really nowhere, uh, no option for a student other than to sit for that test again okay. uh, in order to get their diploma. All right. Well, coming up, we're going to have the first of, what, at least two special sessions, right? Before right. Before the regular session kicks in. What's this first one about? So we've got the redistricting we talked about. And on the call, the governor also included a number of items in regards to campaign finance and state election laws, all that require constitutional amendments. Therefore, we would need a, an election, probably a special election, to consider those constitutional amendments amendments, and I think they kind of go hand in hand with what he's wanting to do uh, with the Supreme Court districts. Uh, clearly, politics are going to be playing a, a big part in this. All of the justices publicly have said that there should be a second majority black district added to the state Supreme Court districts. 
where those lines are drawn, uh, that's the, the details that lie with the devil. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot going on. Clearly, I think uh, conservatives, the governor being among them, want to see that to where it favors adding another conservative justice on the court. Uh, you have also some territorialism in that, uh, for instance, we've heard from uh, Shreveport area lawmakers, Republican and Democratic, that don't like the version of the map that the majority of justices are putting forward. It, it essentially uh, splits Caddo Bossier. Uh, it also splits home uh, Thibodeau area where Chief Justice John Weimer uh, sits and represents. Mm -hmm. So there's infighting going on right now as to whether or not that first version of the map, uh, created without any public input, mind you, mm -hmm. uh, will uh, get any consideration. Mm -hmm. just, to, just to clarify, when we say adding a district, we're not talking about creating a new district. We're, no, we're staying within like, the like seven. We, yeah. Although there was talk about increasing the court uh, seats to nine. I don't know that that's really going to be brought up in the call, but it was uh, a possibility that came up during the 2022 session. It got nowhere, like most of the other uh, proposals, other than the uh, one to keep uh, the congressional district's status quo. Okay. Like with Franklin Roosevelt didn't go anywhere. They tried to expand the, uh, the Supreme Court. So. Right. Well, the governor also has come out in favor of closed primaries. Yeah, and that's really, uh, I think, another another part of the call. And uh, <coughs> the idea being that you would only have Republicans voting in a Republican primary, much like we already have for our presidential mm -hmm. races. Uh, but this would apply to essentially all races at the state level, potentially local, depending on whatever proposal comes up and moves forward. Uh, the critics of that plan say that it essentially silences the vote of the 27 percent of independent voters in Louisiana. That's in excess of, I think, 820,000 voters. Of course, who would be able to vote in the, the general election? Who okay, would, yeah. Completely, but in the primary. Now, is, uh, Senator Cassidy has come out opposed to this idea. Exactly. And think where he lands. He's not an extreme far-right Republican. He's taken grief from pro-Trump Republicans who thinks he's... Did I know, say Kennedy? Uh, I no, Cassidy. you said Cassidy. Cassidy yeah, okay. you did. Uh, uh, Billy Nungesser, our lieutenant governor, who leans more toward the middle in his politics. Um, what the fear is is that you end up with only far-right and for left participants. One thing I'm interested in, Marcia, is to see where the sheriffs land on this. Very powerful lobby in the state. Most are Republican. Many of them, the incumbents, can win outright in a primary election and not face a runoff. If you go to closed primaries, then you're essentially creating a runoff that they otherwise likely wouldn't have uh, had to you know, It used to be in. a system, there was a, a separate uh, primary for each party, the Democratic primary, and then the, the winners of the two. And what would happen if every year the Democrats would win because Louisiana was so solidly Democrat. Mm -hmm. So when Edward was ran for governor, he won the Democratic primary, but it was getting harder. There was more competition for, uh, from the Republicans. So finally, after all that campaigning, here's the Republican who hasn't campaigned at all, saying, here I am, and they're getting closer and closer. You know, like yeah. Dave And so it was Edwards who wanted to get a change to, to give more security to the Democrats. And I think we're just seeing a flipped script right now. Yeah. Okay, so special session begins Monday mm -hmm. and, uh, over these issues, and then there's going to be one on crime, too. It should be one in crime in mid-February okay. after Mardi Gras because yeah. lawmakers have their Mardi Gras plans <laughs> in New Orleans and in Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Okay, all right, Greg, thanks a lot. Okay, Jeff, over to you. Oh, boy, season ended <laughs> already. Yeah, it's interesting, Marcia. The, uh, the Saints won two more games than they did a year ago, and yet I think fans are way more upset this year than they were a year ago, year two of Dennis Allen's tenure. Um, this was supposed to be their year. There were great expectations out on Airline Drive. Uh, the, the schedule was one of the easiest in the history of the franchise. They brought in Derek Carr, handpicked by the head coach to be the new quarterback. Um, he handpicked hand his defensive coaching staff. He turned that over. So there was all these things in place for the team to be very successful and to get back in the playoffs, and they fell short again. They, they, they One game short, kind of squandered some games early in the year. Derek Carr did not play up to expectations early in the season. And by the time they got their act together at the end, they won four of their last five, uh, they needed too much help to get yeah. in the playoffs. And so it's very disappointing. I, I expect we're going to see a lot of changes here in the next week or so on the coaching staff and also I think some big names on this roster, some of the biggest stars on the team, I think might be playing for someone else next year. You know, I, I keep hearing the word culture 
culture of the team, culture in the locker room. What exactly does that mean? Yeah, it's a good question, and I think it's kind of a code word for uh, just the, the mindset, the environment, the atmosphere, the world culture, um, the study habits, some of the, a lot of the intangibles that this organization had prided itself on for a long time in the Sean Payton, Drew Brees era. I think they've lost a little of that. And, and we heard Dennis Allen talk about it at his post-game press conference, saying they need to get back to that winning attitude, that winning mindset. And Mickey Loomis did something unprecedented, the general manager. Uh, he came in after the end-of-season meeting that Dennis Allen had, and everyone left the building, uh, left the room except the players and Mickey Loomis. And he spoke to the team about culture. And what he was, his message was setting a tone for the offseason they need to study harder. They need to commit more uh, off the field to getting back to the, the level that they were at before. Now, whether it works or not, I don't know. They, they had this similar kind of, uh, they kind of lost their way similarly about 2014, 15, and 16 when Sean Payton was the coach. They went seven and nine for three straight seasons, missed the playoffs each of those years. And they had to kind of have an organizational reset. And I think that's what we're, we're seeing now. But the difference is they had, Sean Payton and Drew Brees to lead them out of that. Uh, whether Derek Carr and Dennis Allen can do that, I think remains to be seen. So you, Some people interpreted that as a, uh, uh, a foreshadowing of a uh, coaching change, but I don't think that's the case. I mean, no. It seems like it was Mickey Loomis saying, maybe you don't understand. Yeah. And, and, you know, because there can be changes without changing the coach. Correct. And, and Will, it's a great point. I, I think people understand if you, if you follow this organization the last – 20 years when Mickey Loomis has kind of been in charge. Even the Pelicans, who they've run for the last uh, you know 12 years or so, uh, they don't make knee-jerk decisions. They actually value stability and continuity. They f see it as an organizational asset, whereas other teams around the league are changing out coaches, changing out f front office executives. They see that as sort of running in circles, and they pride themselves, almost like the Pittsburgh Steelers, of being more of a a family-run operation that, that values loyalty and continuity. It's worked, but a lot of that was based on Sean Payton and Drew Brees being here for a decade and a half. That's unprecedented. Yeah. So trying to balance that, sticking with Dennis Allen, I know he's got a lot of support from Mickey Loomis. Mickey Loomis hired him, after all, uh, so he's going to probably give him a little bit longer leash. What happened at the beginning of the season when the, the offensive line was so bad uh, and I think that accounted for so many quarterback injuries. At the, at the, that was poor, one of the worst parts of the team. Well, a big part of it was their first-round draft pick from a year ago, right. Trevor Penning, uh, you know, was the starting left tackle, which is the most critical position on the offensive line, and he's turned out to be something of a bust. I, I think it's probably too early to give up on him, but he lost his starting job midway through the season. At the end of the year, Errol, he couldn't even get on the field over journeyman veterans that had been on the team for just a few weeks. They were more uh, comfortable putting in these backup players that hadn't been on the team for, for very long ahead of the first-round draft pick. That's a big investment that they've got to get more out of. And that also paints uh, you know, a picture of maybe some bigger, bigger problems there in their personnel procurement by a miss like that. But I also think we'll see a new offensive line coach here next year because of things like that. They're not getting the most out of maybe their talent. Just real quick, that final, that controversial final play of this season, is that reflective of this culture issue? I think there's a little to it. I, I don't think you can discount it totally. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that would happen with Sean Payton as the coach. Matter of fact, I know it wouldn't have. There's no way. But having said that, talking to players in the locker room, I don't think it was well thought out. I don't think it was something, a planned insurrection, if you will, or, mm. or disrespect to the other team. I think really it was more of a fleeting thought, short-sighted, to reward a teammate in a, in a very unique set of circumstances with a minute left in the season. Right. And they wanted to really reward him. But I do think there's, there is a little... Look, I understand why Dennis Allen was upset. I understand why the Atlanta Falcons coach was upset. Mm. But I also understand why the players did it, because they were trying to trying to award a teammate that had been through a, a difficult season. Okay, well, of course, there's always next year. Yeah. We've heard that before. We hope. Yes, we <laughs> certainly have. All right, thanks a lot, Jeff. Uh, okay, Will, over to you. This Monday, we celebrate Martin Luther King Day, and a lot of meaning behind that. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, every year uh, with uh, MLK uh, Day, uh, we hear a lot about... Uh, 
uh, 34 words in particular mm -hmm. about uh, content and the character and not right. the color of the skin. Um, but King was so much more in that same speech and so much more in other speeches and certainly towards the end of his uh, uh, life. Uh, he was a uh, fiery and radical uh, character who evolved and changed become somebody who was not well liked by a number of traditional politicians, elected officials, uh, leaders of different kinds, because he took such strong stands, including against the uh, Vietnam War. But, you know, he uh, definitely had Louisiana connections. He was in and out of here a number of times. Uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was uh, founded here in New Orleans with King as a uh, central player. That was over at uh, New Zion Baptist Church over in uh, Central City. And the, um, the Montgomery boy bus boycott, which is you know internationally known, mm -hmm. uh, was actually modeled after our own Baton Rouge bus boycott uh, from 1957. So he took lessons, and he, it wasn't just read about it in the paper. I mean, he actually took lessons from uh, what happened with Baton Rouge and applied those things from Louisiana uh, over in Montgomery. And of course, there's a you know, personal connection uh, with uh, Sybil Moria right. for uh, the uh, wife of the former mayor, but a, uh, an educator, a leader, activist in her own right, uh, who was in school with Martin Luther King. And uh, she speaks very fondly of those days and those times. And, you know, the, uh, the thing about Martin Luther King Day for me is I think it should be a time where we reflect not just on the 34 words, but on King's life and kind of where we are and where we could be. One of the things I remember from one of his speeches is uh, when he said it's different to integrate a, a counter, but seeking equality is a whole different level. Yeah. And I think that's where we are. I mean, he was saying it was difficult at that time. This is before the man died. He's been gone a long time. Mm -hmm. So think about the difficulty and the challenges we face with seeking real equality. Mm -hmm. Because we can't really have the equality that I think we should have uh, without having some things that are systematic, things that are in place to ensure that no matter who is in charge of which or, or thing or that thing, that some things will happen and people will be given an opportunity. Right. And uh, you know, so often it comes to you know, a choice, quality. No, even with something like DEI, there's nothing that says quality goes out the window. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So the struggle does continue. It absolutely and we, and we And we honor that this, this week um, right. and on yep. Monday. And so a lot of festivities here in New Orleans. Absolutely. And the, uh, the Louisiana Civil Rights Museum just uh, has mm -hmm. a, uh, a sculpture uh, uh, over there they, that just came a few days ago in time for uh, the King weekend. And uh, that was by uh, the late Ivory Dawson uh, from Tickfar. He... Uh, was a uh, minister uh, and artist, uh, and uh, that was his rendition of King and the Civil Rights Movement. So that's on display uh, right near the front of the uh, temporary the exhibit. Convention Center. At, at the, inside the Convention Center. So right. that exhibit in, is inside the Convention Center through the front door. Uh, and then there are a number of other activities. Uh, you know, two of them are, one is at Xavier University, on Monday at 2, uh, and that's going to be actually a movie about Haiti, a documentary, mm -hmm. which kind of, the connection would be those folks seeking democracy in Haiti and the mm -hmm. challenges they had compared to King. And then Dillard University's wonderful uh, choir is having a 6 p.m. program at the chapel. All right. Honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Absolutely. On Monday. Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. And always, really. Yep. Okay. Thanks a lot, Will. Okay, it's carnival time, and carnival makes some money for the city. Yeah, and it turns out carnival does do exactly that, more than people, I, I think, imagine. You know, what happened is that in the 1990s, uh, there was the chief administrative officer in City Hall who had this press conference and talked about the city's problems, and he says, we need to tax Mardi Gras. Uh, he says, you know, we've got a huge cost in, uh, in police and a huge cost in sanitation. We need to get more money. 
Well, the crews, when they heard this, were kind of just stunned because in, to them, they're taxed already uh, because they put on the show. You know, there's nobody subsidizing them for doing that. So there's a, a, a committee of, of crews, and they have a, a civic fund that they use for special purposes. So all the crews pitched in, and they hired a Tulane um, economist, uh, Tom McLean, to uh, do an, uh, an economic analysis of Carnival. Now, usually, any time a group hires an economist to prove a point, the economists will prove their point. But what was different, though, is, is the figures that came out, it was the new sources of information that was found that nobody had thought about, all the different places that you look. And that was eye-opening uh, in terms of the, the economic impact uh, that it had. So they've done it again. Uh, they had another professor from, uh, from Tulane, uh, Tony Weiss. She, she concluded that New Orleans, that Mardi Gras brings in $891 million uh, to New Orleans. It's something like 3.6% of the city's gross income is related to Mardi Gras. Now, this is spending all year round because a lot of people, mm -hmm. when they looked at it, you know, they look at the month of February and they look at the, the, the hotel registrations, they say, well, that's how much money Mardi Gras brought in. But, you know, the people making the, uh, making the floats and, and, and bringing people in and all kinds of things going on all year long. And the other thing is that you can look at the number of hotel registrations, but you don't know how many people are just coming in and staying in people's houses, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's an enormous impact. And then the bigger thing is that Mardi Gras really kind of creates the image of New Orleans, the image that sells Carnival all year long. And so, and that's what the, the new professors kind of said the same thing too. It's, it's really hard to measure, but you just kind of know it's doing a lot of, a lot of good out there. Um, so I think the impressive thing about our Carnival and what makes part of the issue here is that we've always had a tradition of being commercial free. Right. What if there was a law, in one time I remember, I think it was uh, Hormel Hot Dogs wanted to be the official hot dog of Mardi Gras. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's a city acting as a licensing agency. Mm -hmm. And there have been all kinds of opportunities, that kind of thing. And the answer has always been no, yeah. we, uh, we, we don't do that. The crews are not allowed to have commercialism either. Imagine if each crew could sell commercialism. Imagine the really big ones like a, a Bacchus or Zulu or Indian, the, the thing they could do. And so I respect that about New Orleans, too, that they've tried to be non-commercial. And so right. with those restrictions, they've been able to maintain this. And Walt Leger, who's uh, head of uh, New Orleans and Company, says what New Orleans does the way we support this event, the way we feel it, is globally significant. Nobody else does something like the way we do it. Right. And, of course, visitors come in, but people from out of state come in to actually participate, be members of crews, members of the marching groups and everything. That's more and more, especially with the rise of super crews, yeah. because those crews have a lot of people and there's a lot of costs. And increasingly, you have people who come in to You know, it used to be that Mardi Gras was just like just a locals thing, you know, only locals. Right. Right, with things like Orpheus and, and Bacchus, that they bring a lot of people in, other people with money, uh, and probably stay three or four nights in New Orleans, right? right. You know, right there. So yeah. Right, right. Well, all very good news there. All okay. Right. Happy Mardi Gras to everybody. <laughs> it's going to happen. You know, Mardi Gras Day, as you like to say, is going to happen regardless, whatever. It's on yeah. the calendar. It's coming up real fast. It, it, it actually is. And uh, there are whole new worlds too, like. King Cakes, for example, which is a whole yeah. new story. I mean, what's going there with the, um, you know, with the economy and so it's, it's really spiraling. It definitely is. Yeah. All right, thanks a lot, E. Okay, over to you again, Jeff, because some good news about the Pelicans, who are actually going to be playing Friday night on WVUE TV. You'll be able to catch it, right? Correct. And uh, look, as disappointing as the Saints' season was, I think there's reason to be optimistic about the Pelicans. That they've won 12 of their last 15 games. I would argue right now they're playing better than anybody in the NBA. Uh, they haven't had back-to-back -back road wins like this against the Golden State Warriors and Sacramento Kings just blow their doors off, if you will. And I think what we're seeing is the maturation of the roster. They're, they're healthy for the first time in a while collectively. Uh, and the two superstars, Brandon Ingram and Zion Williams, have really come into their own uh, and matured into the leaders that, that the team has wanted and needed. And they've everything's coalesced around them, and they're just playing really fun exciting basketball and, and I think now that the football season's over collectively fan base sort of turns to the Pelicans to lead the way and I think we're going to start seeing some really exciting home games in the in the arena. January's like really a big litmus test. They've got a tough schedule in January. Yes. They've started it off well. What do you think's been like the difference? Everyone focuses on Zion turning things around from the in-season tournament. What do you see as like 
it's been really key to uh, this tear that they're on now. Well, I think getting Trey Murphy back, he, he was one of the injured players. To start. He's a rising superstar. I mean, he's going to be a part of a long-term contract coming up. He's going to make a lot of money. <laughs> but he's a young, uh, budding sensation, and he gives them an outside shooting force now to go with some of the other uh, players on the roster. C.J. McCollum's had a great season so far. He was really injured a year ago and played through it. Really tough veteran leader on the team, and he's been healthy. And they're just, I think offensively, they brought in James Borrego, an assistant coach from Charlotte, who has kind of overhauled and tweaked their offensive system, and the players have really bought into it, and we're seeing it right now. I mean, they're, they're scoring in the 120, 130 points a night among the best in the it's NBA. Amazing. Yeah, it really is amazing. The efficiency <laughs> that they're playing with. The other night they had 11 turnovers and 37 yeah. assists. We just haven't seen that. So fingers crossed they stay healthy yep. uh, and, and keep this good kind of karma going. Yeah, keep this winning going. And then, like I mentioned before, WVUE will be broadcasting, what, 10 games total for this season. Yes. Yeah, which yes, I'm going to really talk about that later. Uh, okay. All right. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I preempted you there. Yeah. All right. Then let's get to that point. E. Other stories. Okay. I hope I'm not losing credibility by just giving good news here. Okay. Economic news. But the uh, the downtown development district has come out with figures about the weekend of the Sugar Bowl. It was a big Sugar Bowl. A lot of people in town. They estimate there were 334,000 people who were downtown uh, during that week. The day of the game, there were 110,000 people. That's more than the Superdome holes, but a lot of people who are out there and who are just hanging around and who are going, and going to different shops. I was among those people, I guarantee. There was a lot of people um, that were out there. And one personal example I know is that the, the uh, Kern Productions, headed by, by Barry Kern, had a huge deal with the University of Texas, which he says they got a lot of money, okay? And they decorated downtown. They had all kinds of parties. They had a huge inflatable longhorn on top of the hotel. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was a big economic boon uh, for the city. That's great. Will? Um, city Hall is getting interesting, and uh, there are a lot of uh, stories out there. But uh, uh, one of the uh, fights that uh, people should uh, look for is uh, city council and the mayor fighting over the city attorney. Uh, just recently, uh, the uh, attorney general's office has ruled in favor of the mayor so as city council tries to hold on to money, it's going to be interesting to see what impact that has. It definitely will be. All right. Greg, over to you. We now know how much an outside law firm is going to be paid, and it's a big dollar amount, to review state police policy. And this is in the aftermath of a lot of controversy over the last uh, couple of years, racial profiling and police brutality. You can read about it coming up Sunday okay. at LAIlluminator.com. All right. All right, Jeff. Now, Marcia, you Rick. mentioned yes. the Pelicans <laughs> on WVE, right? Well, tonight is the first of 10 games. They play the defending NBA champions, the Denver Nuggets, on the road. This is the first of 10 games local fans will be able to watch on local TV. And if you've been a Pelicans fan or wanted to become a Pelicans fan and tried to find them, it's been very difficult. Yes. This is huge, I think, for the organization. I think it could be a, a litmus test for maybe maybe a broader schedule for them next year. Okay, it'll be fun watching, we hope. Okay, yes. thanks, guys, for being here. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. Informed Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. Public television is our passion. With so much content that WYES broadcasts and presents online, we are quite entertained and highly informed. Please join us in supporting WYES. This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area.